Everybody get to get the nerves out. Oh. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is Professor Justin Golston. I teach within the supply chain management program here at Bloomsburg. And this on this panel discussion, we're going to talk about supply chains, shorter and more regional. I will be your moderator for this discussion. And the objective of this discussion is based on the fact that uh, supply, the supply of essential goods has become an upcoming, or a ongoing topic with the current situation. And the goal of this discussion is to share some of the experiences of the panelists so that we can look at the local and global supply chains and see what uncertainties that they have experiences and ex has experienced, as well as how we can mitigate risk as we move forward within our local supply chains, as well as our global supply chains. So I'm going to start off with the uh, introductions. Uh, Brenda, welcome to the panel. And can you introduce yourself, give your, for your background? Sure, thank you, Justin. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, currently, I'm a consultant with my own company and um, in the area of governance, risk and controls, um, focusing on the utility, the electric utility space. I spent 37 years in the electric utility industry. I started in information technology, um, supporting our nuclear power plants and our engineering services groups. But most recently, I spent 10 years with um, governance risk programs for the um, overseeing the electric power grid. Uh, prior to that, I spent five years in um, internal audit, leading the governance and risk program for the um, company. You may say, how does that affect supply chain? The federal government um, a few years ago, based upon the risk to the electric power grid being critical infrastructure, um, created a standard that the utilities had to meet with regard to um, protecting and securing both physically and cyber um, the supply chain of the um, operational um, aspects of the power grid. Okay, so um, hopefully um, everyone will learn something new at the end of this. That's all. Thank you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Randy? I'm Randy Fraser. Uh, I worked in supply chain for 35 years uh, for three different companies. Uh, first of all, for Frito-Lay right out of school, I went to Penn State, as you can see from the background, for those of you who have uh, video access. I'm a chemical engineer by degree. Um, I worked for Frito-Lay right out of school and got my MBA while working for Frito-Lay. Uh, my MBA was from Indiana University in Indianapolis. It, it is in finance. Um, but I worked for Frito-Lay in every aspect of supply chain. Uh, they did all their own purchasing, manufacturing, quality, maintenance, shipping, and distribution right to the stores. Um, and I worked in many facets of that up to and including a plant manager. From them, I left and went to Ecolab after nine years. Ecolab's a manufacturer and distributor of detergents and sanitizers. You'll see them in hotels, restaurants. Uh, they're finally getting a little bit on air during this pandemic uh, with their new certifications because they are very good um, at killing germs. So this has kind of been you know, a boon for them in a way uh, to tap into their expertise. I worked for them for nine years as well. Uh, followed a mentor of mine over to the baking industry, where I went to work for Sarah Lee as a plant manager as well. Uh, worked for Sarah Lee up until 2018. When they did a downsizing, I decided to take an early retirement. Um, at that point, I started teaching at Bloomsburg. Uh, I teach the finances of supply chain course, both in spring of the last two years. I uh, hope to do so again in spring of 2021. I also teach at Kutztown University and teach a strategic management course there. Um, again, been at this for a while. Need to hear your questions today, so make sure you get them up. Uh, post them for us. We'd love to answer questions you have versus just talking to you about things you may not want to hear about. So please participate and you'll get more out of this. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, Rich. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rich Wisniewski. Uh, I'm a, a, also a veteran of about 37 years in uh, supply chain management, uh, many of it in procurement and purchasing, and uh, over the last probably 10 years, more in strategic planning and, and industrial operations. Uh, my, my tenure in supply chain includes stints in the United States Navy, which has one of the largest uh, supply chain mechanisms in the world. 
Uh, also for a, a company that is now kind of obsoleted and defunct. It, at, at the time I worked there, it was the largest compact disc manufacturer in the world, uh, producing about a, a million compact discs a day. Uh, I've also had stints at smaller companies uh, with supply chain management in the environmental protection industry, as well as uh, aerospace. Uh, the last 19 years I've spent with uh, one of the largest uh, vaccine manufacturers in the world. Uh, and uh, this COVID has been a very uh, interesting challenge in making sure that the, our supply chains remain intact and uninterrupted. Uh, like Randy, I also uh, dabble in teaching. I'm an adjunct uh, professor both at Wilsh University and uh, Misericordia University, uh, where I, I teach uh, uh, professional and personal development, as well as international business. So thank you for the opportunity to return to the ZIP conference this year. All right, Rich, thank you for that. So, so Rich, I want to I want to stay with you and we're going to go around, go around the room the opposite way. And that, you know, in your in your definition, how do you define uh, supply chain management? You know, based, so, on, based on what we're experiencing as well as based on, you know, your 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 experience. Uh, thanks, uh, Justin, for the opening question. So uh, our company defines supply chain from all the way before the sales and marketing group has had a chance to assess what they're going to sell in future years. So uh, we try to get involved with their planning process because by, by being able to see what they're seeing going forward, we can better prepare for the raw materials and also the services that we might need on the back end. So we, we define supply chain from in front of the supply, uh, I'm sorry, in front of the commercial and sales operation all the, way, all the way back through when raw materials hit our door and are being uh, inspected and validated to make sure that they're what we need uh, to be able to support the business going forward. Perfect. Randy, same question. So as I said when I was uh, introducing myself, to me the supply chain is everything having to do with feeding a business the things it needs to do whatever it is, manufacturing, making, or supplying. Uh, Rich, as he said, procurement guy. So the purchasing side of things, you have to buy the things you need to do to business. You always have to have usually some kind of value added activity you're doing at a facility or elsewhere. That's going to change whatever you're buying into a end user for your consumers, mm -hmm. your product for your consumers. So the quality aspect, the manufacturing aspect, the maintenance aspect, the accounting that overlies all that, the human resources, that all that is really part of your supply chain. So taking those things into account, to me, it's always been you're a jack of all trades once you get into supply chain most of the time. You can keep yourself in a silo. I love that one. But as you progress through all of the facets of supply chain, you'll find building that nice big base to your pyramid makes you a stronger person when it comes to supply chain. Yes, I, I really I really love that statement in that, you know, when students say, oh, I want to go into supply chain. OK, what area? Because supply chain is is so so vast, and it essentially can be what you make it, you know, what you make of it. Because I always say that supply chain is all around you. Supply chain, you know, impacts every single department within the organization. So, Brenda, and your your thoughts? Well, my role was really not in the supply chain, but as a consumer of the end product, and so we were focused on, um, you know, how the parts the components of the product that we were purchasing were, you know, where were they manufactured? Where, how were they getting from point A to point B? How were they being assembled? And then how were they being protected and secured to get to us? So um, we weren't in charge, you know, of that as the consumer, but we were always inquiring with the manufacturer or the vendor that we were working with. So, um, you know, that was our perspective. Okay. One thing real quick that Randy had mentioned, uh, if you're interested in a career in supply chain, no two days are exactly the same. So yes. you, you might be uh, you, you might be expediting a pump that maintenance needs to fix one of your pieces of equipment to get it uh, get it operational again to keep production running. Uh, in Brenda's case, it might be a, a coil of wire that's required to maintain a, a, a power grid. Uh, it, it might be a raw material that's needed for a buffer that's uh, necessary for vaccine production. So um, 
and, and schedules change. You know, the best laid plans of mice and men. <laughs> uh, you know, you know the rest of the quote. It, it, it doesn't take much to disrupt a, a very well planned out supply chain. Uh, one of the things we talked about in our pre-group was always having a contingency plan in place because unless you have a contingency in place, you, you don't really have a plan. Right. Yes, absolutely. And and yeah, that, that's the, that's an excellent point because there's, ne there's never a dull moment, you know, within supply chain management because you'll always have minor disruptions and you'll have major disruptions. We are currently experiencing a major disruption, you know, throughout all industries globally. So with that, given that the focus of this discussion is on more shorter regional local supply chains, in your opinions, and this is for anyone to, be, to kick it off, what are what are the risks that we have currently experienced for for long global supply chains? What are the risks just taking just taking the taking the pandemic aside, you know, in a general sense? What are the risks that we experience with long global supply chains? That's for anyone. Well, I'll start. As we talked a little bit yesterday about this uh, question, the and you know even in classes last year, um, we saw that impact immediately when the pandemic took its grips in February and March, where anything being produced really in China, since so much gets produced there, instantly became at risk into the market here in the United States and elsewhere for any company relying on those parts and pieces to make a. Um, their end product. And, and Apple was really the big one we heard about. The iPhone was actually off market for a while mm -hmm. because the great majority of their components came from China and the supply chain was so disrupted that they could not get a continuous supply. Makes it important over time to continue to draw that supply chain closer and closer to you and not necessarily make it in the United States. As great as that claim can be to add to your customers, is to try and get it at least near shore so you take time out of supply chain. The mm -hmm. key to the supply chain over overall is, again, shortening. You don't necessarily need to shorten it from a distance standpoint if you can do so via time. So those things decrease risk. The less time you have out there, the more you decrease your risk into disrupting your supply and making your end product. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on that, Brenda? Well, yeah, I think um, time is important. So there's in the in the uh, electric utility industry, there are some key components, what we call lead, long lead time. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to be very customized um, products, very um, costly, um, but also very important to the operation of the power grid. Transformers are one. Um, and so you tend not to have... Um, you know, lots of different suppliers that you can go to. You have one, maybe two. And so, you know, to avoid the risk of delay, um, if there was, say, a, a major storm, people can probably remember Superstorm Sandy, which, um, you know, took out a lot of the East Coast. You have spare transformers, which are very expensive. So that addresses it. Another concern um, I kind of touched on in my intro is the cybersecurity. So it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, how quickly you can get it. We want to know that we have a secure product. We want to know that it's not, that we're not um, installing operational technology devices with embedded malware. So the, mm -hmm. the security of the product is incredibly important as well as, you know, the cost and, and the time to get it. Um, you know, and also, um, uh, you know, I'd say consistency of device or similarity you can't um, power grid, especially on the tra transmission side, which are the high, high voltages. Those are built to last for decades, not, you know, a year. So mm -hmm. you're building and you want to be able to maintain. So you want that consistency of product. You want to know that you're going to be able to either replace with something, a light component, or you're going to be able to repair it and, and not have um, extended outages while you're waiting for part. Mm -hmm. Mm. So with those, that's an, that's an interesting concept, and I love the the cybersecurity area. But with that one last example that you that you that you mentioned, with those replacement components, are those replacement components 
based in, although the finished good may be manufactured in Germany, as you, as you mentioned yesterday, would those components be manufactured here in the US or are they kind of make the stock where they're not, you're not gonna have those long lead times for those replacement parts? It, it depends what the product is. So, you know, there's, there's devices called relays and mm -hmm. those, um, there's dozens and dozens of those at each substation. Those we have, you know, and an utility would have a stockpile of them so that, okay. they, you know, when one goes out, they can replace it. And so, you know, they're monitoring to make sure that they have backfill. Those are um, what we call cyber assets. They have firmware on them so they can be, you know, corrupted. Um, with mm -hmm. that's that's why the cybersecurity part comes in. You know, decades ago, those were electromechanical devices, so you didn't have the cybersecurity risk. Um, you know, so they're they're completely different. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. From the transformer part, you have spares. There are um, there are arrangements within the utility industry that if there would be an issue, um, you know just like we have what's called mutual assistance in the electric grid. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if there's a, there's an issue in Bloomsburg and it's a massive storm, we could have um, uh, employees from Louisville gas and electric coming up from, you know, to help repair service. So there are those mutual assistance agreements, not just for people, but for products. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for that. Rich, do you have any, anything to add? Yeah, thanks, Justin. Uh, uh, great points, Brenda, and also Randy. Uh, some of the things we talked about uh, also in our pre-discussion was knowing where ultimately your componentry is being manufactured in. So uh, a lot of times you might be dealing through a distributor uh, or, or a, a management company, and they might be based here in the U.S. It could be right down the street from where your facility is. It's very important to identify where the product is actually coming from. Because if everyone's getting their product from the same exact place in the world, and the world's continuously shrinking, we, you know, Randy talked about the shortening of the supply chain, and this topic is shortening the supply chain in general. Uh, knowing where exactly in the world something is being built or, or manufactured for you is very critical in your design of your supply chain strategy. Because now you're, you're not dealing with a company that's down the street. You're dealing with someone in Beijing, perhaps, or from uh, Malaysia or from Taiwan. Uh, you might think you have a robust supply chain plan. And in, in essence, you're, if, if something is coming to you via ocean cargo, it's about a four-week lead time. And it doesn't take much, as, as pandemic and COVID has shown us, to sever that, that line. The other aspect is... Uh, maybe trying to pioneer your uh, your strategy. Uh, people have been dealing in, as uh, uh, Justin mentioned, in China for decades. Uh, people are in China are actually outsourcing a lot of their work now to other parts of Southeast Asia that are even more economical. So it's everybody's responsibility, not only supply chain, but throughout a company to be uh, responsible for the, 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 the bottom line and the profitability of their company. So a, a very attractive strategy to use in supply chain is to go somewhere where you can buy something more cost effectively than even here in the United States or some someplace regionally. The problem with that is when everyone is pursuing that same strategy, you, you have an issue which resulted in the, in the COVID outbreak of gloves and masks and, and PPE required to protect people from the COVID. If 90% or 95% or even 99% of those materials are manufactured in the same place, like mainland China, uh, now all of a sudden you've, a, you've got a global catastrophe where everyone is trying to get masks and gloves and protective devices and it becomes an issue. So uh, probably what COVID has taught me more than anything uh, from uh, a supply chain strategy perspective is to diversify a little bit more, maybe even pioneer a little bit more places in the world maybe that isn't currently a hotbed for manufacturing might be a good idea to try to strategize and put something in place there to make sure that everyone's eggs are not continually be in the same basket. Right. Yeah, that's that's excellent. And and you brought up a good point and you know the everyone's trying to get these these masks and and other PPE and I had one student where she worked for Serta Mattresses 
and and the the mattress springs come from the same material than the metal that goes into the mask. You know, and I said, you're going to be out of stock for a good year and a half. She's like, no, they're saying three years. <laughs> you know, so now they have to think of, you know, alternate alternate sourcing, you know, to get the to get the coil to make the coils for the mattresses, you know. So so and and we're we're seeing that a lot in a, in a lot of different industries, you know, so. So Courtney, Courtney had a question of what are the biggest challenges you guys have faced uh, in your jobs when when going through through the COVID pandemic? Who wants to take that one first? Rich, you start. I, I, yeah, I can. Yeah, thanks, Randy. He was, he was like, going to go, go first. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm retired. I didn't face many. <laughs> so I, I, as I, I think a few of us have already mentioned, the first thing that happened was all of a sudden, all the orders that we had in place for uh, uh, masks, gloves, uh, Tyvek garments um, immediately stopped. So there, there, there's some discussions and questions on why they all have stopped exactly. But the, the main point, and, and it's a principle of, of supply chain management, is supply and demand. All of a sudden, everybody is calling in orders. They're placing extra orders uh, because items that we normally use in our in our production floor and things that we plan for and things that we establish stocking levels for, not only are you not getting those supplies because they've been severed for whatever reason from the country of origin, but you're also trying to place advanced orders uh, to make sure that we don't run out in the future. So you can imagine uh, in Northeast Pennsylvania, we have this phenomenon, I call it the French toast phenomenon. Every projected snowstorm, the stores immediately run out of bread, milk, and eggs. And the only thing I could think of with, that is common to those three commodities is French toast. So there's a snowstorm. Uh, forget buying any of those three commodities on the shelf. So when COVID hit, those three commodities, not those three, but uh, mm -hmm. masks, gloves, and other PPE immediately became scarce. So uh, our purchasing group, like everybody else, was trying to get those on the books. Raw material lead times coming out of the same region, uh, country of origin, their lead times kicked out from maybe a 12-week lead time to a 24 or a 30-week lead time. And again, the, the phenomenon of supply and demand, all of a sudden, everybody's trying to buy more and more and more. And not to use the word hoard, but any good supply chain management person will tell you, it's better to have and not need versus to need and not have. So it's it's a it's a it's reaction. Reference. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it's not real hard for you to not worry about everybody else because your company's needs are satisfied. But the the problem with everyone trying to do that at the same time uh, impacts the system. And if it's all coming from the same place and the same manufacturers, uh, you've got a problem. So. Initially, that was our biggest uh, issue, making sure that we had enough gloves and masks and other devices of, of personal protection to run the facility. Now, I, I get emails on a weekly basis of some, we the manufacturing process for all of these devices has kicked in of companies who don't normally produce this stuff is now they're contributing to the supply chain. So now I get, I get there's a surplus technically of, of companies that have jumped on board. Now the, the the quality from one supplier to another may be very drastically different, but um, now all of a sudden there's there's a glut, but it took six or seven months to get to the point where there's there's sufficient product in the in the supply chain. Okay, perfect. Brenda, do you have any any experiences? No, not really. As an independent consultant, I'm working remote and, right. and <laughs> consulting on the same topic. So it didn't it didn't impact me personally, and um, I, I know the, um, the you know the federal standard that I talked to. They did not delay that going into effect, even though um, COVID, we were in the midst of a pandemic. So the mm -hmm. they uh, they recognized the importance of the secure physical and cyber, uh, cyber security aspects of the supply chain, and so they they moved forward with it. And it took okay. a time, you know. One of the things I did here, talking to some of my uh, my former. Uh, co-workers was some locations depending what they did with their what their sick policy was what they did with it to address employee concerns did have trouble getting people come to work sometimes 
um, I know a Frito-Lay plant out in Indiana um, allowed people to call into work if they had any of the symptoms, of course, to try and stop the spread, but they paid them. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of absences and difficulty running the factory some days because of people missing. So obviously taking care of your personnel when any kind of emergency happens, especially when it's something with a disease where the employee can get sick is really critical. And we saw that in the, the first responders and nurses and doctors. Um, and then just on down the line from people who were needed at work but had to expose themselves in some form or fashion more than those of us who could stay home. So managing your workforce was definitely something to me that had to be very tricky during COVID and communication was so critical to make sure people felt at ease and understood the procedures, things you were doing, things you weren't doing while you weren't doing them. So taking care of those things and making sure you communicate when you're the leader of a, of a group or a facility at all, anybody reports to you is of the utmost importance. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and and from so similar to Brenda, I I come from I come from the consulting industry, and I was working with my peers where you know they they typically traditionally worked in a face to face environment. So ma management consultants, we primarily worked in in the manufacturing industry, the distribution industry. So whenever whenever COVID COVID happened, you know now we have to work remote. You know, where traditionally, yes, you you do work remote, but there's some face to face environments that they're they're on the client sites week after week after week after week after week. So now you have to essentially make that make that shift, make that adjustment, because in some cases, yes, some projects were, were going to go on hold. But then some projects ramped up because they have to from a management consulting perspective, they have to understand how to how to continue to operate with this with this restriction, with the employees that, that with the restricted employees that, that Red News was, was referring to, you know, so, so there was a lot of pivoting. There was a lot of, of, of innovative thinking. There was a lot of, of creative ideas that had to happen with a number, not just in consulting, but with the number of, a number of organizations. And we, we talked about that yesterday where we talked about, you know, uh, Ford, you know, creating, creating PPE. We talked about Anheuser-Busch, uh, manufacturing hand sanitizer and things like that. So, so there have been a lot of there's been a lot of, of of changes within the organization to create a positive change throughout the throughout the supply chain network and throughout you know our daily lives. Brenda, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to touch on something you were saying as well as Randy and Richard, and I think it may tie into a, one of the questions in the chat about how does supply chain um how could they create more value. One of the things I, I, I'm hearing from Richard and Randy is, is um, you know, with their comment that no day's the same. I think, um, you know, the, the supply chain um, professionals that I had worked with at my at my prior company, um, I, I would totally agree that that was their their view, and um, it may seem, um, I'll say, dull uh, for a few moments. But then, when when something hits the business, they have to react very quickly. And the pandemic certainly, um, you know, stressed that, if you will. But I, I think the the uh, what I saw was the foundational aspect of supply chain. Sure, you have your processes of of purchasing of, of that that whole procurement part, but it's really that I don't know. And and I look for Richard and Randy to opine, but it's that relationship that the supply chain professional builds with the the, the vendors, with the suppliers. And, and I feel that if you have that in times of, um, of, of normalcy, that you can rely on that. It's like you've made those deposits, if you will, through, you know, on, on 364 days a year, that you can make some withdrawals possibly from those same suppliers when, when you're in that state of, of, of crisis or, you know, chaos or whatever kind of label you want to put on it. But I, I think that, um, you know, that's maybe, you know, that's a real value that's that the supply chain professional can 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 bring and add um, looking because I know we relied on that when we were building out um, the risk management program. Um, big companies, they were prepared for us, you know, when we were, you know, asking them to fill out the 250 question DOE, the Department of Energy um, questionnaire for us to evaluate their product products. But then, you know, you have some small mom and pop shops that are that we buy from and they don't know what to do with that. And so 
the supply chain professional being able to work with them and walk them through it was very helpful for us to kind of strengthen the risk management program of supply chain. Randy, may I? You're going to speak, you want me to? Uh, I, you go ahead. I, I, I've consumed a lot of time. Go ahead. So this is just one of the things we talked about in the in the finances and supply chain course. The the textbook we use, or I really wasn't a textbook in that class, talks a lot about your relationship with your supplier, with your vendor. If you're just buying a commodity that's you know very cheap. You probably don't have a relationship. You go buy it from them. You send them a bill. You send them money. They send you the parts. If you truly have a partner, as Brenda said, they're going to respond differently if you are a favored customer of theirs and they're a favored vendor of yours. That's why you got to cultivate those relationships over time so they come through for you first to make sure you don't run out before your competitor or anybody else they might be servicing. You know, a, a good company is going to try and give some to each, but making sure they take care of you first is that relationship you've built every other day of the year for years and years versus being someone that treats them just like somebody giving us a part and never says a word to them other than to complain to them doesn't try and develop a, that relationship with them over time. That's it, Rich, go ahead. Uh, great, uh, great review, Randy. Brenda, great point. Um, I, I just wanted to say that sometimes that partnership word gets overused and overstated. Um, I, I, I think Brenda was absolutely right. The, the, the things you do with your, your supply base 364 days of the year, and to, that kind of prepares you for that 365th day when everything just hits the fan. and there are certain large companies that have a reputation for not really cultivating the right kind of partnership. In fact, one that I'm thinking of is probably responsible for putting more companies out of business than cultivating that relationship. Um, one adage that the sales guys will, and the sales people, uh, and again, they're an absolute necessity in, in everyone's business, but uh, one of their mantras is the customer is always right. Well, in my 37 years of experience in supply chain, that's sometimes true. <laughs> Most of the times it's not. And, and it's supply chain management's job, I think, to give them the options and the information that they need to be able to take a, 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 the right decision for their business. And then that allows you to support your supply chain requirements in your company. So customers sometimes have no idea what they need and they're coming to you for looking for advice and for direction and just, you know, trying to sell them a widget and dropping them on their door and running, you know, those kinds of positions are kind of gone by the wayside. Companies realize that it's, just, it, you know, the, the real service aspect starts after you make the sale and you've got to support the company and what they've just purchased from you and what they've outlaid capital and, and, and funding for. So um, the partnership, aspect of working with suppliers and not just beating them over the head for price you know price is one aspect as we discussed yesterday in our team meeting you know if you got the best price in the world and your the quality is horrible or and they never deliver on time well then you've got a lot of idle pieces of equipment maybe waiting for components that are coming in the door or once you start running them if the machine breaks down because the dimensions are not uh, exact and what you need for your business uh that 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 great price you got it really doesn't mean anything. You've cost your company money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're spending more than than the, than the, than the local than the local manufacturer that that where you could have you know received a high 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 quality product. But I would say that we 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 talked we talked a lot about those vendor relationships and those partnerships. But pre COVID, you know, that's one thing I talked a lot about. Where let's just be real that within the supply chains, a lot a lot of us don't trust our business partners. But I would say that I would say that co I would say that the pandemic kind of kind of stressed those relationships and we kind of had to collaborate and depend on each other. And I think that that was one positive benefit where that trust that trust was indeed increased because we had to rely on each other and and to address to continue to address this this value concern. I think that, you know, the value is in the eyes of the consumer. And, and you can use that voice of the customer. You can use the data, you know, that you can collect to see what the customer views as value, you know, and, and that value is going to start downstream and then move upstream throughout your supply chain, you know. So 
that's the one thing we talked about yesterday and you know sustainability and things like that where now cut now now consumers are seeing value in sustainability for sustainable practices right where before we really didn't really think of you know sustainability as being that important but now we're seeing an, an increased awareness of that and that's where a lot of consumers are seeing you know an increased value um, so so jennifer jennifer asked a question of do you feel that your, your your business has flourished or diminished throughout the pandemic? Uh, Justin, I want to go back just a second, talk a little more about Brittany's value question. Uh, mm -hmm. um, just so important within the supply chain to understand there are really two things when it comes to value. In the supply chain, you can lower your cost. Matter of fact, if you work in supply chain every day of your career for the rest of your life, you're going to hear about what are you doing to take cost out of the system. Um, so get used to it. If you get a job that's truly in supply chain, that is your job. Figure out how to make us more efficient. It can be very, very small things. Um, changing the distance somebody moves to grab the widget to put it in the assembly line. Storing things better so you spend less time searching for them. All those little things are, you know, fractions of a penny adding up. Or you increase the perceived value of your product to the consumer. It doesn't have to be real value. Think of it in these terms. Let's suppose the Android comes out with some kind of special app for their phone that makes it so much better than the iPhone that people perceive that value is better. And they start buying more of them. You know, it allows the Android to raise their price closer to the iPhone and make more money for their business. Conversely, they could continue to lower their costs, lower the price of their Android, and take Apple's iPhone share that way. So really the whole value thing is a look at two things. It's either cost or value added. You know, what's the next add on I'm gonna put on my product that's gonna make people wanna buy it, to differentiate it from the competition. So it's a real simple economic question. I, I, I'd like to add that I think it's economics, but it's economics across the entire process. Um, I, what I, I've seen where things go wrong is when if, supply chain is has to be seen as part the supply chain organization has to be seen as part of the business solution and that the business group has to work with supply chain if supply chain um you know i, I don't know I, i'll use an, a, a utility example if if we would be building a, a new substation which is you know where power comes in and goes out and you know gets spread around the grid there's a lot of equipment you know that needs to be um, acquired in order to do that. And they'll create what they call lay down yards in order to, to, to uh, accumulate the equipment and build it. If supply chain would find a, um, I'll say a, a, what they perceive to be a, a more efficient and it saves some money in the supply chain process, but that increases the cost as the construction is occurring because now maybe more security is needed or you, know, um, you need 24 by seven, whatever, or you have to start adding additional vulnerability tests or you know different types of of commissioning activities it was a you know it's kind of like we used to call it you're, you're just playing whack-a-mole you know you're 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 solving one problem but it's popping up somewhere else and so you actually you know i'd say the value comes from that looking at the entire process you know beginning to end and and that goes, you know, so the supply chain process, in my view, it like kind of runs along the top of the business process, but they have to, you know, there's all that communication in between those those processes, and they 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 can't be looked at in silos. So um, it's just that total. Okay, the, the point that Randy had brought up, um, I, I I don't want anyone to get the misconception that uh, there's there's a facade being placed uh, when, when Randy mentioned perceived value. Okay, so companies are very big into KPIs, key performance indicators, and suppliers of your commodities and your services have a kind of a target on their back because it's real easy to see that you paid a dollar for something last year and you're now paying 90 cents for that. It, it, it's, a, it's a very, very bona fide, it's, it's a number, it's, it's right there. When, when what Randy described is adding value into your process and becoming more efficient, those kind of things are a lot harder to identify and put a price tag on, okay? So uh, you, you have to really be able to sell 
what you're doing and, and actually show that I, I, I cut maintenance time in half by this person not having to run out into a 5,500 pallet warehouse trying to find this commodity, bring it back to the machine and, and, and install it in, in the process. Uh, something that Brenda said is also very important. Your company, it, when you're looking for a job in a company or a position in a company or a career in a company, I think what Brenda said is very, very important. How do they, do they, they, they look upon the supply chain function, the, the, uh, the, the planning process and the procurement process is purely overhead? Or, or are those people truly involved in meetings where they're discussing strategic outlooks for the company and, and looking forward to how they're going to support the business? Or are they just, once in a while, they're, they're throwing a bone and invited to a meeting. Those are the companies that you want to work for that have the strategic process and, and the strategic output of supply chain embedded into their company. And they're actually consulting you as, as subject matter experts versus just, you know, you know, th this is a, a procurement clerk that's placing an order for a widget. You know, those companies, you, you get burnt out really, really quickly, and you're absolutely never appreciated. Excellent. Excellent. So, so going back to the next question, do you think that your organizations have, have flourished or diminished, you know, given your, given your business, given the industries that you work in? During COVID or in general, Justin? What, I, I forget what the question read. It says throughout COVID. Yes, throughout COVID. during COVID, yep. M may I? Yep. So uh, next year's bottom line for us will be very, very good. And it's unfortunate uh, it's because of COVID. So I work for a vaccine manufacturer. We're one of the companies that's developing a vaccine for COVID. Uh, we have orders on the books right now from, from the government that's worth billions of dollars on top of our bottom line for next year. Uh, our people are absolutely working themselves to death. We, we have the normal business. We also manufacture a flu vaccine. So right now we're in the, in the throes of getting the flu vaccine out the door. And on top of that, uh, we're, we're working to get COVID vaccine out the door. And it's never going to be fast enough. Uh, but something we had discussed yesterday the government will not release any vaccine into the marketplace that is not safe and, and effective against what we're trying to prevent, which is people from getting COVID. So uh, on top of the normal business stresses that we have, uh, we have this other additional, uh, while you're doing your regular stuff, you know, include the COVID stuff on top of that. And um, you, you can say that uh, we're flourishing and that we're gonna have a great year between this year and next. And we normally have very, very good years. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping something that Randy had said earlier about people working from home, that, that's always in, in my capacity, it's always been a question in our company. Some of the support functions have traditionally been allowed to work from home. My production planning and strategic uh, supply chain has not. Uh, as of the 17th of March, we've all been forced to work from home. So we've proved that we can remodel our business to show that uh, we can we can continue to operate the business from our kitchen table or wherever it is we happen to be sitting. Uh, at some point, I, I'm hoping that the system doesn't break because everybody has been so entrenched in keeping the, the regular business running plus the COVID uh, that uh, people are starting to get a little burnt out. So, and there's no relief in sight. We, we are not gonna be through this through 2021, we're, we're going to be at this kind of working at this same pace. So um, we're, we're, our company is going to have to keep a real close eye on people, making sure that they at least get some time off to rejuvenate and refresh. Because otherwise, we're going to have a uh, we're going to have a, a problem, I think, with our personnel. That's an excellent point, and one thing I didn't really think about. I mean, I know that I know that everyone's talking about the benefits of working from home, but I mean, I know I can speak for myself where I'm working probably about <laughs> double the time of when I was in the mm -hmm. office environment because you, you don't have that commute times so, and, and you're yep. just sitting in, in your offices and I've probably gained about 20 pounds in the process. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, I mean, there's benefits and there's drawbacks. So I know, and I know that everyone, everyone has, has their own story. Um, Randy, do you want to share your thoughts? Well, I can only add in generalities, of course. And we talked a lot about 
uh, bring Brenda mentioned most specifically, uh, those who responded well and changed their business model as fast as they could to feed the new market standard will probably do okay, if not even better, to some extent. Some companies demand dropped so dramatically there wasn't a whole lot they could do. Um, but how did they change themselves to offer different products or offer those products in a different way? Um, you see almost you can buy anything now pretty much online. Every company seems to be delivering for free. Anything mm -hmm. you want to your door because people weren't going out to the stores. I mean, retail is going to take the big hit, I think. Um, simply because people are not out browsing for things. They're going to go buy, but they're not out shopping for the most part, at least like they used to. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a lot, of, a lot more changes. We're already seeing them in the retail side of our lives that shopping malls. Think about movie theaters. I know the theaters around here shut down for a while, tried to open for a month, but nobody came, so they shut back down. Um, are there going to be movie theaters in the future? If so, how many? Um, versus online entertainment, which is we're already headed that way. How many more online um, entertainment providers will there be? And how much are going to be producing their own content? You know, versus it's going to be, you know, one. Certainly when Rich and I grew up, it was, you know, three networks and a couple UHF channels was your choice. <laughs> what is UHF? What is that? <laughs> exactly. Um, That's another so course, doctor. <laughs> how does that continue to change? We will see. It's a great question, Jen. I don't think we know the answer for sure in general, but we will continue to see more change because of COVID and things like that um, as time moves forward. Right. And to add to that, I think that there are certain there are certain industries that are thriving. Um, um, to Randy's point, there are exactly what, what we're doing right now. You know, there are a number of different um, virtual conferencing platforms that have popped up. You know, some of them are absolutely amazing. And and you you also you're also seeing telehealth. The telehealth industry is absolutely booming right now. Um, I have I have one student where he 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 collaborated with uh, one of his peers who's a who's a practicing doctor. They started a telehealth organization in in March. They now they're at a now they're a ten, a ten million dollar company, right? And that might be on the low end for that industry. That might be on the low end. I don't know, you know. So so there's a lot of industries that have popped up, you know, from the pandemic. Um, Brenda, do you have an, any thoughts? Anything to add? Um, well, just to tie on to something you just said about industries popping up, it wasn't due to COVID, but um, it was due, it, it was based on the uh, enhanced need to understand the risks within supply chain. There are now um, third party providers that are doing those risk assessments, those cybersecurity assessments of suppliers. And they, you can, um, you know, a lot of different models, whether you just buy um, that assessment from for a specific vendor, or you kind of join the membership with this third party provider, and um, you know you get access to all the information um, that the entity has looked at, and they're doing you know global assessments. They're they're buying equipment and 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 like kind of tearing them apart and to to be able to to uh, to share that information and they're looking at all the as Richard said all the components so yes your phone you know you, if you have an Apple iPhone it says designed in in Cupertino but where where did all the parts oh, yeah. but well, where did all the parts come from you know that's something that the nuclear industry had to to know you know decades ago but it's now it's 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 now getting into mainstream. Um, uh, to tie on to something Richard said, if you know, I would say if you're a supply chain major or not, when you go out to um, to look for that job, you know, you're you're you are being interviewed, but consider yourself. Look at it from a perspective that you are also interviewing the organization. Right. So don't you know? Don't don't look at it that you can thrive anywhere. Yes. Know, know yourself. You're going to thrive more <laughs> at some organizations than others. And you, you, you know, as, as the, you know, as the student graduating, you're going to figure out, you know, what the best place is. I, I'd say, um, you know, look at graduation as a, or, or if you're going into an internship, you know, if you're, you know, a sophomore, look at it as a project, you know, put together a plan as to where you want to, um, you know, where, where do you want to even look, you know, location, type of company, does the company have the mission that, 
that you, you know, subscribe, uh, subscribe to, you know, do, do they, you know, are they really a big supporter of the environment and that's important to you? Well, then you're probably going to, you're going to probably feel better working there than, than somewhere else. So mm -hmm. kind of keep that in mind. Brenda, I think that's a great point. You could make a million dollars a year and be absolutely miserable and hate going to work every single morning. So those, you know, place the company you're, you're working yeah. for and what you're doing, those three elements are absolutely essential. It, yeah. it is. I mean, I just left a career after 37 years. Um, I'm not going to say that every day was, you know, like a birthday party, but I enjoyed, you know, 95 plus percent of every day that I went, I felt like I was adding value to a, to something that was critical to life, you know, uh, supplying power to, 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 to drive everyone's life, you know, so you have to, you have to find that connection. Yeah. I think that's one of the, that's one of the biggest takeaways. Good job. Thank I mean, thank you for that, Brenda. I mean, that's one of the biggest takeaways in that I always shared a story, I always shared a story where, you know, well, back the, back when I was an undergrad, they used to publish how much graduates made. I think that might be illegal now, but, but, you know, the top two, the top two graduates, you know, in engineering went to New York, worked for like six or eight months, hated life. They quit and went to NYU and went, and went to the MBA program. You know, they were the highest. They were they made the highest out of out of an institution in less than six months. You know, so don't 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 be driven by the money because that's that's not that's not that's not always the that's not always the most the optimal solution. Now I'll, I'll be I'll be for you for those of you who who have taken my class. You know, I'm the first one to tell you that. You know, so. Uh, Okay, so Brandon Brandon asked asked the question of what are the few ways that you can lower supply chain costs, and then I came back and asked him did we answer it, and he said yes, it was answered through other discussions. So we did answer that one. Jennifer asked uh, for ISO procedures. They're always they always want you to come up with things that that could happen within your company that need to be that need to be assisted. For companies that do not have a global pandemic, <laughs> you know, mitigation strategy and their procedures, how how will that be added and how will you keep up with the new procedure because of the pandemic? So this is kind of like that uncertainty management planning we talked about yesterday. Yeah, and that's exactly what it is. When you talk about ISO, Jen, I think obviously you know that ISO really talks about what am I going to do if, what am I going to do if it's the if-then planning that ISO requires to get yourself certified. Um, Strange thing is, you generally don't write them so specifically that they address COVID-19. You know, they address what do we do if our supply chain is cut for any reason, and hopefully that generality would respond to COVID or an explosion in a factory in China where things were made. You know, your your the contingency planning has to be a lot more general, generally speaking, uh, for ISO. Any company that foolishly says this is a once in a you know century thing is thinking very short-sighted yes uh, people have already changed there's no reason for them to go completely back when they can probably get benefits of still spreading the business around nearshoring things like we already talked about making sure they're diversified enough within their suppliers that they would not hit as hard from a global pandemic and then even their own flexibility on the manufacturing end, as we mentioned earlier, I think Justin talked about many companies making something else. Some companies adding to their product line to gain new customers based upon demand for things that changed when COVID came. Obviously, a bit more specific with COVID. That's one of the things that would have been not really that predictable. But no, I think most companies are going to make all this stuff add on, bolt on, and not get rid of things that have value to them. Because again, that's always the equation. How much value does this hold for me to keep this as part of my business? Excellent, excellent. Anything else, anyone else wanna touch on this? Uh, I think we talked yesterday about business continuity and sustainability. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, things like this, you know, the, 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 the cataclysmic disaster that's going to happen is as remotely as it is or as remote as it seems uh hopefully people who don't have uh sustainability planning are, are now going to put that into their into their business model and 
something as simple as, you know, do you have enough product? Do you have enough PPE coming in to sustain people? Where are the people going to work in the event that they can't come on site or they shouldn't come on site because of social distancing needs? Can they sustain the business by from their from their kitchen table again or from from Randy's Penn State office at his house? So that, that's going to become very important from uh, business planning. And it, it, the one interesting thing that I've, I've been thinking about recently is when all these companies who have multi-billion dollar buildings and these, you know, the glass palaces in cities and in places that are really, really nice and, and they don't really, they're overhead. They, they don't produce any product out of there. I think companies are going to start looking at do we really need this real estate? You know, for the last eight months, we've proved that we can we can run the business from people's kitchen tables. Do we really need a multi hundred thousand dollar lease payment a month to sustain this building in the middle of Manhattan or the middle of anywhere that the, the company's corporate office is? Well, we could just have these people work from home, and they they're they're more comfortable. They're they're just as productive, and and in fact, as we discussed. They're putting even more time in because they don't have to drive 45 minutes or an hour to commute into work. They're giving the company more value and, and it's, it, it could potentially cost us less. So we may see a really interesting turn in the real estate market in the coming year or several years because of specifically because of COVID. COVID mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Good yes. And that's, and that's one thing. That's one thing that I've seen. I've, I've, I've heard a lot within the industry, even from students. You know, they have they have peers that have just have just started within the industry, you know, and, and new college graduates are love working from home. Right. You know, they've had a number of organizations where, you know, they had to you know, they had to work from home and beginning in March. But then the organizations have realized how much cost savings to Rich's point. You know, they're saving of, of not building all these of, of not, you know, paying mortgage for our our you know, leasing all these office spaces and now they're having their employees to work from home and, you know, for forever. Now, there's also organizations that so there was another situation where they said, yeah, y'all work, y'all working from home and we're just we're just going to meet, you know, in downtown Columbus, Ohio, you know, once a month or every other month, you know, as and they're, and they're going to they're going to save money because now they, they were able to shut down two office buildings and they just bring everybody in into a Marriott for a day. Mm -hmm. You know, so so we're going to see a lot of that. And especially whenever you see organizations like Twitter, you know, publishing things like that, where, you know, it's, it's, it's optional. You know, we'll keep our office buildings open. But in reality, you're going to see a lot of organizations kind of renting out those spaces. So if they keep those office spaces, they're going to rent out spaces to other organizations. Um, so. So, yes, you're going to see a huge shift within the real estate industry. And I just had this conversation with a um, with a CEO of a startup company, you know, in New York City. You know, he said that you in Manhattan you can't find you can't find a one bedroom studio under like six thousand or something like that a month. It's crazy, you know. So, what do you think? What do you think the the operating? What do you think it, it costs to 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 operate or run a business within you know Manhattan? You know, so so I don't know that. I'm just I'm just saying. So so if you're gonna you're gonna be able to save that much money a year. <laughs> You know, it's, it's almost it's almost a no brainer. So, yeah, I think we're going to see a shift from that from that perspective. Um, so I know we talked about sustainable sustainability and, and, and things like that. And that's that. Again, that's increasing in, aware, in, in awareness. Uh, Brenda, do you have experience of, of any kind of changes and developments uh, from from a consult? Well, even even pre COVID, you know, do you have experiences in how how like that energy sector addresses the 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 inner the the sustainability type efforts for industries and organizations um i don't know if this is spot on but when i i when i look at sustainability i think of like the economics the economy the society and the environment so mm -hmm. that i look at it that way and mm -hmm. other said otherwise profit people and planet is the word. that's what i think because then i can remember three p's um i mean as a util, as you know, electric utility, and especially when you consider generation, I mean, they've been, you know, at different times under attack for you know fossil fuels and 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 the you know the impact on the environment. So um, you know, from a profit standpoint, with all those buildings closing, which I do believe is going to happen, I think mm -hmm. there are, I a lot of office space is going to go uninhabited. You're 
I mean, the the electric utility industry is already seeing a, a decrease in demand for for power. So that will have a ripple effect. I mean, I think we've talked about that in a lot of our different responses. It's like, you know, you, you get ripple effects. Um, you talked about the matr mattress manufacturer. So um, the electric utility is going to have to become much more efficient and, um, you know, from a cost perspective, while regulated utilities pass costs on to their customers, they can only pass on so much. It's right. not unlimited. It, it is reg it's regulated. Um, likewise, with all the, um, I'd say the distributed generation, uh, you know, solar panels, windmills, things, wind, wind farms, things like that, that is um, changing the, the, the structure of the utility industry. You know, these are non COVID examples, but um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it's ties to more business strategy, I think, than um, I don't know, supply chain, but um, I don't know. I, I think I used a different example yesterday. That's not quite coming to me. <laughs> But all 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 business all business strategies in, include supply chain. So you're spot on with that one. All right. <laughs> now, can I say something real quick? Because Brenda just uh, cued uh, a thought up. Uh, something that whenever electric cars come up, I always and and again because I'm in in supply chain management, you you always try to think of things from end to end. You know the entire the entire chain. Yeah. Electric cars, you know, they're great for the economy or from the for the ecology perspective you know they're not putting pollutants out in the air fantastic but you have to have a charging station to plug those things in and i don't know if everybody mentions oh this electric car concept is great where the power is coming from to re recharge those batteries in that car because obviously it's going to come from a, a place like uh you know ppnl or, or or duquesne electric or or somebody who actually is doing the physical manufacturing of these commodities or of, of electricity that then in turn is going to recharge your car. So uh, you're, you're, you're not going to completely walk away from the fossil fuel or the carbon footprint and, and make yourself feel better just because you buy a, a, an all electric car because you're going to have to repower that car. So again, congratulations. You have the money to buy an electric car, but uh, you're, not con you're not completely off the, the CO2 grid. Yeah. Just to put it bluntly. Yeah. And, and I'll just say it's, 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 it's very complicated. And that infrastructure to support the electric car industry is, I mean, we're not there. Um, if anybody's interested, there's a, there's a show on Apple TV plus it's called long way up. And it's about these two guys that um, they get these specially made um, Harley Davidson motorcycles. They're electric and they start at the yeah. South America and their goal is to drive those 13, 14,000 miles to Los Angeles. And um, one of the problems is there are not any charging stations. And so they are, you know, it's, it's like they have to worry about getting that infrastructure built, not just, you know, and their, their whole schedule is not just weather or their own physical, you know, well being. It's can they make the distance, you know, that they need to in a day um, before the, the bikes, you know, are out of charge and what do they do if they can't? So it's, um, you know, I, I found it an interesting show, um, you know, talked about ecology. It talked about just personal endurance, but also, you know, the infrastructure and it was, um, and taking a, a thought from beginning to, to fully, um, ex fully execution. So it was pretty good. I, I am watching that tonight. Thank <laughs> you for that. Sure. You're, just you're, brought a full, up, you're a full of nuggets. You're on fire. <laughs> Brenda just brought up another very great task. I don't think we, we, we touched upon yet in the discussion. And that's, you know, you have to have boots on the ground at some point because Absolutely. every, every Absolutely. company in the world has great access to Google and, you know, their, their company profile on Google or whatever uh, platform you're, you're researching will be pristine. It will be top notch. They all, everybody looks great. It's only by going to the country where you think that the manufacturing is going to take place and taking a look at the infrastructure, just looking at a map at your home or in your home office is not going to, it's not going to suffice. You, you need to find out exactly where things are because if you're sourcing, say from a place like India, they don't have a lot of good paved roads. So something on a map might look like it's only about two miles. It might take two days to get from those two points on the map. So check the infrastructure out, get there, physically walk the last mile 
on where they're planning to shift from point A to point B, because you might be surprised. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And that's and that's that's a very interesting point where where uh, Patagon Patagonia, I do a lot of the research on sustainability and Patagonia is one of the leaders in sustainability. Right. And and, you know, Patagonia has been transparent to say we have we have we have seen a, a supplier in our network that, you know, has unethical practices. But they seen that by having boots on the ground, like like you said. You know, where if we if they just look at documentation that this supplier sends into them, they're not going to see that. Right. But because they're 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 performing those supplier audits, they've uncovered that, and they're very transparent to say, yes, we have this in our network. We have we have we have no you know completely completed you know that 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 agreement with that with that supplier because you know they have unethical practices. You know, so I think that I think that you know yes, you have you having that that transparency and and being within that particular network is is very important. Mm -hmm. Um. So so we have until twelve thirty. So if you have any more questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. This is going, I mean, this is flying by. I'm, I mean, I'm really enjoying this. I'm speaking Justin, we still have one more question we haven't addressed from yeah, Connor. Yeah, so from Connor? Yeah. Yep, so go ahead, Randy. So what specific skills do you have that qualify you to be a successful supply chain member? You read it, do you want to answer it? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, so this, so is, this one is one of those things that how much, table, Randy, right? how much how um, much how much specification you need? What how how narrow should you be in what you're learning? Um, what's the employer going to look for? For me, when I was hiring, um, I really looked for more of a person who I thought could be a problem solver, and who could lead people successfully. Um, I didn't care as much about what your certifications were, what things you did in particular. Because I knew, as we talked earlier, I was going to need you to be a jack of all trades at some point. So your leadership qualities, and for me, my ability to think in crisis times and involve people in problem solving and how we went about getting past issues that came up were so much more important than anything um, that was specific to a degree or a skill that I learned. Um, as I said, when I introduced myself, I'm a chemical engineer by degree. Did I ever use any of that chemical engineering anytime in supply chain? Probably not. Did I use the problem solving skills that I learned during my courses to be, get my chemical engineering degree? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. But I still found that my nerdy engineer had to go away and my people skills had to shine, my ability to talk to people, to draw out the best in them, to get them to think for themselves, to get them to apply their own ideas to their specific job, to monitor themselves and make themselves get work done. You know, as Rich mentioned, as we go into working at home, think about all the ways you can goof off at home that you didn't have to goof off while you're in the office. There's more than just being able to chat around the water cooler as options now. So you have to drive yourself. So those characteristics from a skill standpoint that I really want to see are how well do you communicate? How well do you listen? How well do you speak? Um, what things did you do to lead people? And not necessarily only in a business environment. What outside did you do? You know, were you a member of scouting that might show some leadership? Did you do anything in, you know, future farmers of America? Things like that, that show how you led a group of people are vitally important to your success in supply chain. Excellent, excellent, love that. Rich? Okay. Uh, on top of what Randy said, um, and again, Randy, I'm, I'm not trying to patronize you at all, but I always like the Joe Paterno methodology or strategy for recruiting. Um, Mr. Paterno's philosophy was, I'm gonna go out and recruit the best athletes and then figure out where I'm gonna put them on the field. So basically from, you know, taking the football analogy aside, he was looking for the best and most talented people. Uh, and as Randy mentioned, uh, if you look at a skill set chart, uh, chemical engineering is a heck of a long way from supply chain management. Right. Uh, I, I graduated from Bloomsburg with a degree in marketing. I can count on one hand how many days I've spent in a marketing capacity in my, in my career. And the answer is zero. However, 
when you're learning about you know uh, sales strategy and, and marketing strategy or negotiations, uh, I was sitting on the exact other side of the table in my procurement career. So uh, take whatever skill set you have, learn whatever you can from uh, your courses at Bloomsburg, and then see how you can apply it to your everyday job. The other thing is never be afraid to take a chance and expand your horizons because I, I, I tell myself and I tell other people, I learn something new every single day at work or at least every week that I didn't know from the week before. And I've been at my company 19 years. So if you approach the educational perspective from the fact that you, you should never stop learning until about 10 seconds after you die and not a second before, you're, you'll know that you, you can't possibly know everything there is to know about everything. So take a chance once in a while, as Randy mentioned, uh, look at job opportunities. And even if you have absolutely no skills or no preconceived knowledge of, of what they're looking for, you know, go in and talk to your boss and say, you know, this looks like an interesting opportunity. I, I think I'd like to give it a shot, even though I don't know anything at all about it. And if the company is progressive enough, then it'll allow you the opportunity to try and also fail because there's no way you can conceive, uh, uh, achieve success in something you have no idea about initially. Showing that initiative, hopefully the company will allow you the opportunity to learn what you need to know and then ultimately bring more value back to the company. Excellent. Excellent. Brenda, you have anything? I'll just add, you know, um, go into it with an open, any job, an open mind. I, I look at it, getting a bachelor's degree as when I'm interviewing people, as they've got the ability to learn. And so you have to continue to do that. Um, I, I don't pigeonhole people in based on what their degree is, because I think so many jobs today, it, you know, you can draw from a, a lot of different degrees. I have a degree in mathematics and I'm not, you know, sitting doing actuarial tables. You know, you, you can, you can move around. The other thing um, I would say is, um, you know, be willing to speak up. If you're working in a company, um, you know, it, it can be tempting when you're new. Sure. You're going to, you're going to gauge when you feel comfortable doing that and when you're not. But um, if you go and look at, um, you know, different, I'll say, I'm going to label them business failures. Um, there's always some component of silence that allowed mm -hmm. that failure to occur. Um, if you look at the Boeing, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Max 737 issue, when they went and did the root cause on that, people knew that the coding was incorrect and what was happening, but no one spoke up. So problems occur because of silence. And mm -hmm. um, so kind of, you know, it, it ties with integrity. So if, if mm -hmm. you, know, you have to be willing to live with that. And I'd say, I'd, I'd say that, you know, that courage to be able to speak up or the courage to lead, you know, you, you grow into, you know, as, as you mature, um, but just kind of keep it in the back of your minds, um, you know, regardless of what field you go into. Okay. Yeah, that was that was that was excellent, and and that's and I I echo all of those points from my from my two cents in that I think the biggest gap when I'm working with when I'm working with organizations, especially startups, is that leaders leaders say that new college graduates are overall overall across the board are lacking the soft skills, right? Those communication skills to what Brenda was talking about. They're lacking those leadership competencies. Um, they're they're lacking the critical thinking skills. You know, these these I, I had I had one I had one startup that I worked with. This kid this this one student was I think he was second in his class, and 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 this organ the startup this startup hired him, and he said he said Dr. Ghost he said this guy is brilliant. He said, but whenever he's faced with a stressful from stressful situation, he cracks. He said he can't handle it. You know, and 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 that comes in with that critical thinking. That comes in with those soft skills. So I say that I say that. So so to, to the group, what's more what's more important, hard skills or soft skills for you all? Soft. I can teach hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think what you were saying, Justin, I categorize that as grit. If if mm -hmm. somebody has a has some grit, they can get through you know that crisis, that chaos, you know that that problem. They can they're they're able to see problems as opportunities. Excellent, 
Excellent. What do you think, Rich? Uh, I think you can teach people how to do things. You can't teach them how to reason. You can only give them the opportunity to think for themselves, as, as uh, both Randy and, and Brenda mentioned. Uh, because just substituting rules and, and, and SOPs and, and SWIs in uh, a situation, you know, that, that might handle some of the stuff. But you, as Brenda mentioned, you, you, you grow into your position and, you, and you, you have this intuitive knack of trying to figure out, OK, there's no rule that covers this specific thing that I'm looking at. But <clears throat> my gut feeling is that this is what we should be doing. This is, you know, speak up. If, if right. that's what's required, uh, don't don't let the emperor walk around without any clothes on, without letting them know that your, your majesty, with all due respect, you know, <laughs> you have no clothes. So company, a lot of companies have those placards up on their wall and, you know, courage to speak up. Uh, sometimes they don't practice it, though. Right. So, again, back to the yes. back to the thought of looking for a company who actually practices what they preach. Uh, that That's really essential. So. Uh, managers that allow you to make mistakes. Uh, 3M yes. has a great model where they they allow their people time to go in the lab and just play around, and and mm -hmm. they, they 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 chart all of their failures because they know that every every time somebody attempts something and fails, if they're looking at something passionately and they want to succeed at something, they're going to figure out a way on how to make that thing work. And you know the 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 post-it pad is is an excellent example of something that was a failure that they, they turned into a, basically a million dollar piece of business for themselves. So mm -hmm. let them learn, let them fail, and then not just let them go off on a corner, ask them to figure out what went wrong and maybe next time they have a, an opportunity, what are they gonna do to change the outcome? I think that's one of the things I worry about with <clears throat> with everyone working remote. I think I think there are enormous mm -hmm. benefits, you know, and, and it, it increases the resource pool you know, for, for areas that are having a hard time getting certain skill sets that you can now, you have the whole US or more to recruit from. Mm -hmm. But I think that the the culture that you're trying to impart, uh, you know, from your company, I think you lose an, uh, uh, an aspect, a, a means of doing that when you don't have people face to face. Um, so I, I, I worry about that. Right. Now, I will say from my experience is that because of these virtual conferences, I've I've been able to collaborate with people from around the world and I've been able to. And, and that and that and that so that sort of more regional supply chain topic is very important in that I'm collaborating with people in, in Australia, with in India and in China, you know, and I'm getting their perspectives on supply chain management. I'm getting their perspectives on sustainability. And now I'm taking now they're they're looking through the lens that I can't say I haven't looked through before. And now I'm I'm able to take those approaches locally. I'm able to bring those approaches within Pennsylvania. I'm able to bring those approaches within, you know, within the East Coast. So I think that that's one thing that that has been that has been very beneficial with this with this pandemic and that, you know, we're we're pretty much. I mean, the opportunities are, are, are unlimited in terms of the collaboration that you can do. But but Brenda, you are exactly spot on where I think that. <laughs> you have you had um, have unlimited collaboration, but then you're restricted by collaboration <laughs> in some place spaces as well, right? You know, so it's a double edged sword. But 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 I think that you know we we have I mean we're 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 learning we're we're being we are we're all being agile, you know, and we're and we're learning from innovative 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 ways to 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 do business. Now I think that you know rich. I think that all of us talked about, you know, being able to make mistakes, and and, and I, there's been a number of studies, academic studies that that have have shown the positive impacts and positive outcomes to that, you know. So so, I would be looking for an organization to, you know, allow you to make mistakes because it's it's huge, you know, that leads to innovation, that leads to collaboration. So that's the <laughs> that we don't have any more questions. Um, so does anyone have any, any parting, any parting thoughts, any, any, uh, uh, last, any final words, any final words of suggestions, recommendations for students? Well, again, I think we probably were supposed to end at 1215. So I oh, guess yeah. we might have lost. It's at 1230, but okay. Uh, but no, I have nothing else to add. Good job, right. everybody. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thanks for those of you attended. Appreciate it. Just one, yes, one thanks parting, for one parting, uh, uh, statement, Justin, um, when I graduated from Bloomsburg in 82, 
supply chain management existed, but there was no formal curriculum at all around it. You know, it was it was just something that wasn't taught. So it chances are 10, 15, 20 years from now, there, there'll be there'll be disciplines out in the business world that don't even exist today. So again, just be open to them and uh, be willing to take a chance in trying something new. Okay, thank you. Thank Brenda, you. anything? No, I think all I think right. I've shown thank you very much. Thanks. All right, thank you all. Thank you, everybody. All right, see you. Thanks.